and hopefully some of our colleagues. Okay, we are live. So welcome everyone to the Center for Behavior Analysis webinar for May. Um, today I'm delighted to introduce Jenny Ferguson and Emma Craig. Um, both Emma and Jenny completed their PhD studies at Queens. And they will discuss telehealth research and um, at the very end we'll have time for questions. Um, enjoy the webinar. Uh, we will have about an hour and 15 minutes and then I will talk to you at the very end to address queries. So Gemma, Jenny, Emma, to you now. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll just, thanks Katrina for the introduction. Jenny and I will um, just continue on from that. So I'm Emma Craig, um, as Katrina said, I did my PhD, graduated last year from Queen's University Belfast and my research focused on telehealth. I um, have worked for individuals with autism for about 10 years now. I've worked clinically in the US, England, Northern Ireland, Ireland, and now a lot of my work is conducted both face-to-face -face and on telehealth. So Jenny, I'll hand over to you and you can introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Jenny Ferguson. Um, I have just very recently completed my um, PhD at Queen's University in Belfast, um, also under um, Dr. Katrina Dunavi, and also focusing on telehealth. Um, so my research has focused on parent training and telehealth. Um, prior to conducting um, my PhD, I had, um, I've got about 12 years experience working um, in the field of behavior analysis. I started off in early intervention in um, um, Toronto and Canada. I moved to school in London um, before moving to um, Belfast to complete my PhD. Um, so thank you very much to everyone for coming. Um, I hope you found the the session um, informative and enjoyable. So I'll pass back to Emma to get to um, discuss her first study. So maybe before I'm going to be off camera, just to add that your research started well before the pandemic and it continued throughout the lockdowns. So your expertise about best practice, why the world moved to a hybrid model uh, we're really interested in to listening to that expertise and the data great. you accumulated both before and during the pandemic. Yes, so, great. Thank you. So you can maybe take me off the camera. I'm not sure. Maybe does Chris need to do that? I'm not sure. But you can go ahead. Yeah. Ah, she's gone. Great. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I guess we. Um, figured we maybe just start out by describing what telehealth is. I'm sure most of you here are very much aware of what telehealth is now, given the current climate and what we've all been through over the last few years with, with the pandemic. But basically telehealth, um, there's, a, there's a number of terms out there to describe it. So we've got telehealth, we've got telemedicine, um, teleconsultation, but really in the literature, we, we see it labeled as telehealth. So we'll refer, refer to telehealth throughout the presentation. Um, it's also known as telemedicine and it's the use of communication technology such as video conferencing and telecommunications to provide education and treatment of health related conditions. It has been used effectively across a number of conditions including cardiovascular disease, bowel disease, cancer, haemophilia and mental health. Um, way back in 2011, prior to the pandemic, um, telehealth was recognised as a potential next step in healthcare and government initiatives across the UK. So what we started to see was GP surgery starting to adopt telehealth models. And again, this was prior to the pandemic and um, the NHS were looking to see if, if they could use telehealth as a way to cut down waiting lists and um, things like that. And then, of course, the pandemic hit and we found an awful lot more out about telehealth than what we used to know. So um, prior to Jenny and I both conducting our individual studies, um, we worked together alongside Dr. Katrina Dunavi to conduct a systematic literature review. So um, I'm just going to touch on this very briefly because it, it drive the design of our two individual studies. Um, but it was conducted back in 2018. The purpose of the review was to identify and categorize key intervention properties. So what was the current literature like 
on the use of telehealth to deliver behavioural analytic interventions for individuals with autism. What intervention categories were um, being, was it being used for? We wanted to assess the overall outcomes of the selected studies. So were the outcomes of these studies positive, negative or mixed? And we also examined the quality of the selected research. So we, um, in order to do that, we used the evaluative method for evaluating and determining evidence-based practice in autism by Reichow. So the results, um, the results of the FA, uh, the sorry, the SLR indicated that um, the use of telehealth was feasible and effective. Results were demonstrated across intervention categories. So the intervention categories that that we saw from the review where telehealth was being used mainly was really in um, naturalistic interventions, functional behaviour assessment, um, preference assessments, and comprehensive behaviour packages. So um, positive were, positive results were demonstrated by all improving interventionist f f treatment fidelity. So most of the studies focused on training caregivers to deliver interventions. And um, we saw from, from the review that interventionists were successful at delivering intervention, interventions with high treatment fidelity. The results indicated positive outcomes for some, but not all individuals diagnosed with ASD. So we've seen some positive gains with the individuals that were included in the study. In the studies, we found a total of um, 28 studies which focused on the use of telehealth as a model for providing behavior analytic interventions to individuals with ASD. Um, as a result of the review, we found that um, the, there's a lot more research needed to report on methodological rigor. So the um, quality checklist that we used revealed that although a lot of the studies included in the literature demonstrated high experimental control, there was a lack of reporting on interventionist demographics. So their age, where they were from, um, education, background, things like that. And that um, resulted in them scoring a lot less on the um, evaluative method. So um, future research really needs to make sure that we're, we're reporting all of those results accurately. So, of course, as a result of COVID, um, the literature surrounding telehealth re really has boomed. Um, there was so much that came out because so many people, it, there was no other option. We, we had to still deliver services to our clients. So um, a lot of studies have came out as a, a result of that to help practitioners and guide practitioners and how to adopt a telehealth model. Um, I just want to mention that prior to the pandemic, our research, the aim of our research really was to see could we disseminate the science of behaviour analysis to individuals living in rural areas, to places where um, individuals don't really have access to BCBAs or appropriately qualified professionals. And then halfway through our research, the pandemic hit. So it really quickly took a bit of a shift. Um, the main aim was still about dissemination. Um, however, there was a much bigger need then in, in light of the pandemic. So the onset of COVID-19 um, severely reduced the ability of behaviour analysts to provide face-to-face -face services. Telehealth was adopted by many as a solution. And in March 2020, the BACB updated the ethical guidelines to include telehealth as a means to reduce risk and provide continuation of care. So this included suggestions on maintaining and generalizing skills via telehealth and move into an online parent consultation model. So the BACB had said, you know, um, if we can still work with our clients over telehealth, just focusing on ma maintenance skills, um, generali generalization of skills, training parents to target generalization probes. Um, unfortunately, we are still in a position where these suggestions are a reality for many countries. I know a lot of places have really moved forward now in terms of the pandemic and it's just really becoming a way of life. I know here in Northern Ireland where we're based, everything is kind of slowly back to normal now, but you know, there's a lot of people out there that are still really vulnerable and the pandemic has scared a lot of people and a lot of people now are wanting to do a lot more telehealth um, 
appointments for things because that they they really are just scared and we know that COVID is still about it hasn't left us um I know here a lot of people are still working from home so we still need to continue the telehealth research So um, there has been a lot of new research, as we said, as a result of the pandemic. Um, the Journal of Applied Behaviour Analysis and Behaviour Analysis and Practice both had special editions focusing on the use of telehealth. Um, there's been subsequent systematic reviews, um, one of which was conducted by Neely and colleagues in 2020. And even the results of this review show the massive increase in the research that's out there. Our study was um, conducted in 2018 and we found 28 studies. Um, Neely and colleagues found 45 studies. And I'm sure now if we were to do another one in 2022, there would be a lot more. Um, new research has included um, comparisons with face-to-face -face models, studies involving adult participants. So this was really welcomed. When we conducted the review, there wasn't any studies using adult participants. So um, again, it was nice to see this addition to the, re to the literature. Studies directly providing services to individuals with autism or intellectual and de developmental disabilities and um, studies where um, telehealth was delivered by RBT level staff. So this was all things that were missing from the previous literature base. Jenny, is there anything you want to add there? You okay? I think you're muted. Uh, there we go. Um, no, just that obviously, um, obviously, the pandemic has just changed everybody's focus, and a lot of people were kind of um, were kind of doing a lot of um, a lot of different practices without necessarily having the the research to back up what they were doing. But this was kind of unprecedented times where people didn't really have any other options. Um, but luckily, I think the research is kind of starting to, to catch up, and and as you can see, there's a lot more coming out, and a lot more kind of practical. Um, use of how we would use telehealth in everyday in everyday life. So that's really important. Great. So um, a lot a lot of the studies that we found, and even a lot of the studies, the more recent studies, a lot of them are coming out of the US, and it's it, it's great. They're great um, additions to the literature. However, the research coming out from a more international level is still very limited. You know, we, we want to be able to generalize all of these results and we want to see that they can be adopted on an international level. Um, so studies have been conducted in Iceland. There's been a multinational study including countries such as Greece, Turkey and Ukraine, um, Belgium, uh, Serbia and the United Arab Emirates, UK and Ireland, Mongolia and Japan. But there's still further research that is needed from researchers outside of the US, particularly because services outside of the US are extremely limited. Um, I know in the US, in, there's insurance that covers ABA services. Um, here in the UK, particularly, there's um, very limited funding and what's available. I, I think in Northern Ireland, and correct me if I'm wrong, there's currently no funding available. So families do have to pay privately out of pocket to receive services. So I'm going to um, conduct, uh, I'm going to discuss with you the second study that I conducted as part of my PhD. And we looked at the effectiveness of a brief functional analysis and functional communication training conducted through telehealth. Can I just check, or can people see the PowerPoint slides? Just there's a, a question in the, can people actually see the slides? Yeah, okay. It might be just you, Anna. <laughs> Good. They are being shared. Great, Jenny, could you move to the next slide for me, please? Thank you. So the purpose of this research was to um, disseminate from an international context. So like we said, the, a lot of the research is currently focused, um, coming out from the US and we wanted to see, can we, can we adopt this on an, an international level? And additionally, the BACB international changes, you know, there's still a lot um, 
that's unknown for behaviour analysts outside of the US and Canada now. Um, we're very lucky here in the UK that the BACB granted an extension on the international changes. And I believe Australia also received that extension. However, many countries, um, the deadline for taking the um, BCBA, BCABA, RBT exams is December 31st, 2022. So not much long left on that. Um, there's limited research in the area of a brief FA conducted via telehealth. So um, there is a lot of studies out there conducting FA. Um, there's very little out there that conduct a brief FA where the conditions are much shorter in duration. And I think it's really important to look at this area, particularly when when you are conducting sessions through telehealth, time is really limited. And we really want to still make sure that we can deliver function based interventions where we have conducted an FA um, in a short amount of time. Thanks, Jenny. Sorry. Um, so our research questions then were, um, can non US based interventionists run a brief FA through coaching from a BCBA on telehealth? Can a brief FA conducted via telehealth identify the variables maintaining challenge and behaviour? Can interventionists implement FCT with high fidelity via telehealth? And can challenging behaviours be reduced through FCT overseen by a BCBA via telehealth? So the participants that were involved in this study, we had three interventionist, interventionist child dyads who participated. Um, we had Fatima and Sasmita. Fatima was 36, Sasmita was five. Fatima was from the United Arab Emirates. Her primary language was Arabic and she also spoke English. Um, she was a teaching assistant in a school. Majida and Daniel. She, uh, Majida was 26, Daniel was four. And they were also based in the UAE and they were working in the school. And then we had Jana and Catherine, Jana 33, Catherine of four. Um, Jana was a speech and language pathologist based in Serbia. Um, I just want to make a quick note actually that both Majida and Jana had taken part in a previous study that we had conducted and they had received um, training on the principles of ABA from a previous study. These um, trainings included um, the, an introduction to ABA, there was nine training sessions. So from the previous study, an introduction to ABA, um, they learned about ABCs, uh, reinforcement, extinction, punishment, chaining, task analysis, prompt, prompts and prompts fading, data collection and generalization. Fatima had not been part of that study. So we then gave her the, the training prior to this study starting just to make sure that that didn't influence any, any of our results. Thanks, Jenny. So um, the settings and materials. So um, I conducted sessions in a secure locked office in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, so sessions were conducted in the classroom within the school in the UAE for Smita and Daniel, and in the speech and language therapy room within a clinic in Serbia. I had used a MacBook Pro. It had a built-in microphone and camera and participants were sent, they were loaned equipment if they didn't have access to equipment. So I think just one of my participants required equipment. We had loaned out a Logitech uh, webcam, wireless earbuds, and then the platform that we used was either Zoom or Skype. They had the choice to um, choose which one was easier for them to use. And then for transferring any videos, we used Dropbox. So the um, study used a multi-element multi design to evaluate the results of the brief FA. And then we used a multiple probe across participants to evalu evaluate the FCT and interventionist treatment fidelity. So we conducted the study in three phases. Our first phase was baseline of target behavior. We then conducted a brief FA on the challenge in behavior. And then we moved through to FCT through live training on telehealth. So the mastery criteria interventionists were required to score 80% or higher on a treatment fidelity checklist over three consecutive days. And children were required to have zero occurrences of challenging behavior over three consecutive days. So the um, measures, we 
measured child challenging behavior for Daniel that was aggression. And it was defined as any instance of hitting, kicking, biting, or pinching. For Katharina, we measured elopement. That this was defined as moving or attempting to move away from the teacher or leaving the session room. And for Susmita, we um, we measured disruption. So that was defined as crying or screaming with or without tears and flopping to the floor. So we also measured interventionist treatment fidelity during the FCT phase. I just want to point out that we didn't actually measure treatment fidelity of the interventionist during the brief FA. And the reason behind that was because we, um, the interventionist would have been really influenced by what they were doing in the FA because they were always coached by a BCBA. Um, the interventionist typically would not implement an FA without somebody who was very experienced in those procedures, typically a BCBA. So we felt it wasn't appropriate to measure treatment fidelity during the FA. Um, we measured independent mans, which would which were defined as any instance of requesting a reinforcer appropriately without the need for verbal or physical prompts. Challenging behaviours were measured using frequency during the brief FA and FCT phase. Appropriate mans were also measured using frequency and treatment fidelity was scored as percentage of steps performed correctly from the treatment fidelity checklist. Our fidelity checklist then, um, this was for the FCT phase and this is what, what um, interventionist behaviours were required to look like. So we were looking if interventionists would set up the environment appropriately. So did they have materials available such as a My Way card, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail later on? Did they have tasks available? Did they create an appropriate motivating operation? So putting the child in a state of sati satiation for an aversive task or deprivation for attention. Again, this was all related to the function of behavior that were the results from the FA, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail later. We looked if the interventionist provided immediate reinforcement for an appropriate mand. We looked to see, did they um, not provide any demands during the child's free time? So during reinforcement time, we didn't want any demands present and that they provided enriched attention during free time. We looked to see if they prompted an FCT response when it was required and if they placed the challenge in behavior on extinction. So, um, the procedures then, how we started, as I mentioned, Fatima received the um, nine previous training documents that the other participants had received from a previous um, study that we conducted. Interventionists then met with me online and we conducted a fast assessment. So this was to try and um, gain some informa information around the target behaviours and um, what the hypothesis function was. Interventionists were then instructed to go and take baseline videos of the behavior. So what we were really looking for here was interventionists were not instructed to create situations to evoke challenging behavior, but they were told to go and take video footage at times where challenging behavior was likely to occur in the past. Um, this way then we could see um, did, did they score anything on the treatment fidelity checklist? Did they attempt to um, try and prompt an FCT response. Um, did, did, did they reinforce any appropriate mounds? We also looked to see if there were any appropriate mounds there from the child. Once we received baseline videos, they uploaded them onto Dropbox. We, we took all the data collection. Um, interventionists met with me for didactic training. They were sent um, a total of four PDF documents. Each topic, was, the first topic was functional behavior assessment. The second topic was preference assessment. The third was FA and the fourth was FCT. So they received the document um, about two days prior to meeting with me online. They were instructed to read through the document. We then met online. We worked through the document together. I answered any questions. We had a bit of role play and then I provided feedback. After each didactic training session, interventionists were required to take a quiz after each, each training document to assess mastery, content mastery. So we looked for an 80% mastery criteria on the content. If they didn't score the 80% on the quizzes, then they we arranged to meet again and we went through the document again just to make sure that they, they definitely have the knowledge there. We then met online to conduct the brief FA. 
Um, so this was in the classroom for two of the participants and in the speech and language clinic for the third participant. So conditions were five minutes in length for each participant. Um, one of the children, Daniel, his we started off with his FA five minute conditions and the results showed that challenging behaviours occurred at a really low rate. So we scheduled another brief FA and we extended the condition length to 10 minutes, which was where we, we started to see more, more of the challenging behaviours occur. From the results of the brief FA, then an appropriate FCT intervention was designed. So what happened there was um, I met with the interventionists online. We kind of discussed the procedures. Um, they had the child with them. We began um, teaching the intervention. Um, after that session, the interventionist was instructed to keep practicing um, outside of the online telehealth session and record one of the sessions. They then sent one of the session, they then sent one of the videos onto Dropbox and that's where I collected the data. Thanks, Jenny. So this is the results from the FA. Um, for Sysmeter, we had a clear function of demand, escape from demand. Daniel, we had a clear, uh, it was a, a bit of a multifunction. So we had escape from demands, access to attention. And Katharina, we had escape from demands also. So all FAs were um, successful in identifying um, the function, the variables maintaining challenging behaviors. This is the results then from FCT and treatment fidelity. So you can see here the little white open squares. This is measuring the child challenging behavior. And the closed, the closed black dots are measuring the interventionist treatment fidelity. So as we can see after baseline, then when interventionists met with me online, after we had conducted the brief FA, they were taught then how to implement the FCT intervention um, go away for a couple of sessions, run it themselves, record it, send me the video, and I would then collect the data. So we can see some nice, um, really nice increases here for all interventionists. We saw some great decreases in challenging behaviour from the children and an increase in appropriate mans for reinforcers. Um, I just want to make a note here as well, actually, that um, as this was conducted in a school setting, COVID-19 lockdown for this school happened right near towards the end. So we had planned to continue this on slightly longer, especially for Majida and Daniel, Jana and Katharina. Unfortunately, um, schools closed and we were unable to continue with that. So uh, Majida and Fatima both did meet mastery criteria. Um, Jana unfortunately did not, but we would have hoped that had we have been able to continue on with the sessions that that we would have seen an increase in in her treatment fidelity thanks jenny so um the brief fa was effective at determining variables maintaining challenging behavior via telehealth despite the duration of fa's being only between 45 and 90 minutes so sismita's so fa the total duration for her fa was 45 minutes 55 minutes for Katharina and 90 minutes for Daniel. Interventionists were um, able to successfully implement an FA when coached by a BCBA via telehealth. Interventionists successfully implemented an FCT intervention to decrease challenging behaviours and increase appropriate mounds with high fidelity. So just some of the limitations, as I mentioned there, we had the school closures um, as a result of COVID-19. This really highlighted as well the importance of parent training, which Jenny will talk to you a lot about shortly. Had this have focused on a parent training model, more than likely as a result of COVID, we probably would have still been able to continue with sessions. But as this was focusing on training professionals, because children do still spend a lot of time in school, so we've got to equip their teachers with the knowledge that they need to decrease challenging behaviours. Unfortunately, it, it just meant that when schools closed, we couldn't, we couldn't continue. It also meant that we were unable to conduct follow-up probes. We had also planned to fade out reinforcement. So the 
um, appropriate mounds were reinforced on an FR1 to begin with initially, and we had hoped to fade that out and thin the reinforcement, but due to the lockdown, we, we were unable to do that. We'd also hoped to conduct social validity measures, so there were no social validity measures conducted. Um, another limitation was that we we were not from the same culture as the participants. And I think that's really important to highlight, especially when we're wanting to disseminate on an international level, you know, um, having the researchers or clinicians from the same culture as the participants will really highlight and create culturally sensitive interventions, which we really need to focus on. Technology uh, was definitely not without its limitations. I'm sure you're all aware of technology limitations. I'm not gonna go into too much detail about that because Jenny and myself will just discuss that towards the end of the presentation. We also didn't conduct any treatment fidelity on the BCBA's behaviors. So um, the BCBA coaching the interventionists on the FA procedures, it would have been nice to have that data. Okay, I will hand over to um, Jenny. I'll take questions for my study at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, so today I am going to talk um, about my PhD research, which involved two parent training projects. Um, the one I'm going to talk about today um, is the efficacy of using telehealth to coach parent training to coach parents of children with autism spectrum disorder on how to use naturalistic teaching to increase man's tax and intraverbals. Okay. Um, so like I said before, my, my PhD research focused on parent training using telehealth. Um, this training was um, focusing on using um, the platform to provide training strategies in naturalistic um, intervention, which were designed to increase the communication um, of young children with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, this consisted of two projects, so I'm going to talk mostly about the second project today, um, but I'll briefly mention the first research project, um, which was conducted using participants who were located um, within the same country as myself, so I'm located within Northern Ireland, um, so this um, involved participants who were located in the United Kingdom um, and also within Ireland. Uh, if you want to know uh, a little bit more information about this study, um, I've included a link there um, for the paper um, published. Um, additionally, the, so the study I'm going to talk about today mostly um, involved parents who were located elsewhere in Europe. Um, so the, the participants, the parents were located in Switzerland and in Germany for this project. Um, so it was my hope that, um, that both these studies together could kind of reflect the priorities um, of telehealth and reflect the priorities of what telehealth could and perhaps maybe even should be used for. Um, so being able to disseminate um, expertise to more rural and remote locations within a country um, and additionally being able to disseminate expertise to um, internationally to, to areas where that expertise is just not present within the country. Okay, so I wanted to focus on parent training um, because this is something that I am very passionate about doing. Um, I think it's a very, very important component of what we do as behaviour analysts. Um, so parents have more influence than, than anybody on the behaviour of their children. Um, they know more about their children, they know what makes them tick, they know what they like, what they don't like, what's going to work in teaching. Um, so I think that's very, very important to to include within any sort of kind of intervention. And it's very important to recognize when we are doing parent training, it's important to recognize that, that the parents are the, the person that knows the child best. Um, and when we want to empower them and we want to upskill them, it's really, um, it's really vital that we recognize that and share that with them. Um, additionally, appropriate support has been demonstrated as a contributing factor to reducing the scores of parental stress. Um, so in general, support has been has been shown to, to reduce stress, but specifically support from professionals. Um, unfortunately, um, as is the case in a lot of the world, a lot of um, different countries globally, especially outside of the United States and outside of Canada, um, gaining access to this support is not, not easy. Um, and parents might feel that they are abandoned by services after the diagnosis. So there's a lot of emphasis on getting this diagnosis, but there's not much um, advice on what is next. Um, and obviously we know 
as um, behaviour analysts that there's a, a great deal of evidence to support the use of, of ABA, but many parents find themselves in a position where they cannot access the service. It's not, um, it might just not exist in the country that they are in. Um, it might not exist in an affordable, affordable platform. Um, so telehealth model, a telehealth model is an excellent way um, to increase this availability of the support um, and to, to help parents to access this, this training. Um, I think as, as well, um, outside of the US, it's just important to, to highlight just how, how few BCBAs there could be in countries. Um, so the countries that, that the parents came for from for this this specific project were Germany and Switzerland. Um, so Germany has currently got 51 BCPAs and Switzerland only has 22. So you can imagine the, the possibility of gaining access to, to this expertise is very, very limited for these parents. Um, additionally, I think telehealth is in quite a unique <coughs> position where it can really get into um, the homes of parents. It can really create a snapshot of what is happening at a particular moment and perhaps in an even better way than a face-to-face -face visit because you don't have the, the influence of me being there and hovering around and probably jumping in. Um, so it really has a unique ability to, to provide this snapshot of what is going on within, um, within the, the home environment. Um, so this is very, very important when we're looking at the, the behaviours that we want to teach, um, that we want to teach the parents. So we're wanting to teach them in the environment that the parents are going to use them. And we're wanting to upskill them in ways that they will continue to use. And we want the, the changes that we see in, in the, the children to, to kind of maintain and to generalise um, from the offset. So that's very important. Um, and telehealth has a huge potential to do that. Okay. Um, so the main research questions for this for this project were, were we able to um, carry out the strategies designed to increase communication? Um, were parents able to, to carry out these strategies to a high level of fidelity? Um, so a similar way to Emma's study, we had fidelity checklists that were very important. We wanted to know, are the parents actually able to carry out these, these strategies? Um, do they rate this, this training favourably? Again, another really, really important measure of social validity. Um, of course, we know that higher social validity means that the parents are more likely to do it again in the future. Um, it's more likely to, to lead to a maintenance of, of the behaviour. Um, do these strategies increase child scores on personalised communication targets? Um, does the parent training lead to an increase in positive child affect? Um, I'll discuss this a little bit further um, in subsequent slides. Um, and does the behaviour maintain over time? <coughs> so the um, participants who took part in my study, there were two parents who took part. Both were um, mothers. Uh, both had children who were aged approximately three and a half years old at the start of the project. Um, both were quite unique in terms of parent training um, projects in that they already had um, background training in ABA. Um, they um, for example, they had taken part in RBT training and kind of um, verified training um, offered from different different institutes around the world. Uh, I think this is maybe uh, a good option for parents these days. There's a lot of online training that's being offered, um, a lot of online training that's been offered at much reduced costs to kind of traditional um, parent training. Uh, packages, for example, the free RBT train that's been offered in Autism Partnership um, is potentially something that um, that parents can avail of and it, it offers a really good low, low cost um, option for parents. Uh, additionally, um, I think it's important to note, however, however, the parents might have this kind of background training, they have the, the knowledge skills, um, but what we do know from the research is that um, they need the coaching to go along with it. So past research, um, research that I've undertaken, research that Emma's undertaken, and then a whole a whole number of other studies have shown that this kind of knowledge-based didactic training just in the theory alone, so just in knowing about reinforcement, um, just in knowing about the functions of behaviour isn't enough to actually create 
meaningful change and isn't enough for them to be able to implement the strategies to a high level of fidelity. So unfortunately for, for these parents that took part in, in this study, they find themselves um, a little bit of, in a little bit of limbo. Um, so basically they found that they were um, they had the knowledge, but they hadn't necessarily had the coaching on how to implement that with their with their child. Um, so they were left in a little bit of limbo where they couldn't actually access that training locally. Um, it's also important to note that although the parents had this, this kind of RBT training, they didn't work professionally um, within the field and they only used the training to kind of upskill themselves and to work with their own child. So that's important to note as well. Okay, so the setting. So like I said before, participants took part in their own homes. So one was in Germany, one was in Switzerland. Um, this training took part right in the middle of global lockdown. Um, so both participants about halfway through the, the training ended up going into lockdown. I ended up going into lockdown. So we're all kind of isolating in our, in our own homes. Um, so this meant that a lot of other sessions, a lot of other um, activities that the children would be doing during the day were canceled. So kindergarten, speech and language therapy um, sessions were all cancelled for the for the children. But because we could um, we could um, obviously do our training via telehealth, we didn't have to cancel anything, and we actually had really minimal minimal disruption, if if anything, um, as a result. So that was a good kind of practical demonstration of of using the telehealth when it is needed. Um, so apologies if you hear my toddler is just having a bath. So. Apologies if you hear a lot of crying. <laughs> um, so the training was conducted using play sessions, using toys and materials that were already in the home. Um, so that was important as well. Uh, so we used a multiple baseline across behaviours for this study. Um, so because we only had two participants, we needed to kind of demonstrate control across the different um, behaviours. So this was an extension of prior research, so an extension both of my prior research and an extension of research um, that was um, already in existence. Uh, so it focused on training for longer periods of time. Um, so within the first study that I completed for my PhD, I found that we had really, really good um, outcomes for parent fidelity. So parent fidelity um, was was greatly improved and it was it was really a really good outcome for parent fidelity. Um, unfortunately, the, the child outcomes, which were just looking at manding, were a little bit more variable. So some of the children had really good outcomes, some of the, the children had okay outcomes, and some of them we didn't see all that much change at all. Um, so this is recognisable within the telehealth research, both within our own systematic literature review and subsequent reviews. Um, so it's recognised that there is variability within child outcomes. So this is something that I wanted to focus on um, within this specific study. So I wanted to focus on, um, I'll answer the question about the languages after. Um, uh, so I wanted to focus on, um, I wanted to focus on the, the, the child outcomes as opposed to the, the parent outcomes. Um, to kind of guide the project. So that meant um, extending the sessions beyond just the, the parental mastery. Um, so for example, if a, if a parent mastered the, the, the skill in session two, I would continue to have at least five sessions to give the children opportunities um, opportunities to, to enhance their communication further. Okay, I'm gonna make this a bit bigger because it's very small, is that better? Um, so these are the procedures that I followed within, um, within the study. Uh, so similar to Emma, I collected baseline videos. So these videos were um, 10 minutes in length and the parents were instructed to play with their child as they would typically in a way to communicate um, with their child and enhance communication. Um, and then completed an assessment, which was um, either one or two hours, depending on on the child and it was based on the VB maps. So I just took sections of the VB maps and assessed um, assessed them and, and got their, their parents to run some, some tasks and, and test some different areas. Um, the parents then took part in a multiple choice test. 
this was just to assess whether they had the kind of background knowledge um, in ABA from their from their previous training. So both both parents passed that with flying colours. Um, and then sorry, um, and then took part um, in didactic training to introduce each new strategy. Um, so when each strategy was introduced, um, the parents would first um, be given a PDF document which highlighted uh, the strategy, highlighted the rationale, um, provided them with activities that they could use, um, shared the, the fidelity checklist with them. Um, so prior to any coaching taking place, they were they were provided with that that overview um, in the form of a PDF, and we discussed that together. Uh, we then moved into live coaching. So this involved the parent playing with their child, interacting with their child and receiving feedback from myself using um, using headphones. Um, so when they were doing something that was very good, I would encourage them and then offer them solutions if, if things weren't perhaps going to plan. Um, so the strategies that, that we taught within this project were following the lead. Um, I'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Uh, we then looked at manding, tacting, and intraverbals. Um, so the parents were in, in, they were introduced to each of these in turn across the sessions, and then they were to incorporate each one into the play into the play session. And this was um, data was collected via a ten minute video that they sent after each session. So the main data collection for this project was the this videos that they recorded outside of the session. Um, we then looked at maintenance, um, which was two times, uh, we took two collections of maintenance, which were 10 minutes videos, um, matching the kind of videos that we sent earlier on. Okay. <clears throat> um, so like I said, um, like I said before, the first strategy was um, designed, was called Follow My Lead. Um, so across all of the strategies that, that we taught, I really wanted to prioritise motivation. Um, so this involved recognising motivation, creating motivation and utilising motivation. Um, this was very, very important um, within this training because it was such an important component of, of how children learn. Um, if we find the motivation, we can utilise the motivation. And that's where the reinforcement is. So that's something that I really, really wanted to emphasise with the parents. Um, additionally, I think it also helps us to understand when our children are opting into a session as opposed to opting out. So if we have if we have sessions that children are motivated for, they are kind of leading the way the play is. They are deciding that they um, they are deciding what is being what is being done. This is kind of a way that they have of, of opting in. So it's kind of a measure of their um, assent as well. So then that again is very, very important to consider um, because we want to obviously have have our very enjoyable, enjoyable sessions. Um, so this strategy, parents were first taught to follow the lead of their child, not to take over the play, not to come with any sort of um, any sort of beliefs of this is what we're going to do within this play session, we're going to build a tower. Um, they were taught very much to follow follow the lead of their children and, and use that to build on these learning opportunities. Additionally, um, for obvious reasons, they were, um, they were taught the importance of having preferred items in the environment. Okay, so these are some of the activities that parents were taught um, for the first strategy. So the first strategy involved parents being taught um, how to introduce mans into their play sessions. Um, so these are some of the activities that they were taught um, in order for this to be the case. Um, it's important to say here that we weren't reinventing the wheel, we weren't doing anything particularly innovative. These are these are kind of strategies that are that are used probably every day in many different settings around the world, many different naturalistic teaching, but we just wanted to introduce them um, in telehealth and introduce them to the parents. Uh, so the first strategy um, I called add-on. So this is um, imagine that the parent and the child um, are playing with an activity and the parent has um, some items that can enhance this current play situation. So for example, 
if you're doing an arts and crafts activity where the child has kind of like boring everyday um, stickers and the parent comes over and says wow I have these fantastic glittery stickers that you can add to your to your picture this is going to increase the motivation and it's going to increase the chances that the child is going to going to ask for that fancy sticker as opposed to what they already have um, or for example a simpler version if if the, the child is um, is coloring with just a couple of colors and the parent comes over with a whole rainbow collection of um, of crayons they're obviously going to be motivated to ask for the different colors um, so small amounts, uh, parents will offer a very small amount of the object. Um, so for example, a small piece of Play-Doh, um, a small amount of bubbles, and then prompt communication. Uh, pausing play, parents start to play with their child um, and then suddenly stop. Uh, so social games, things like tickles, singing songs, blowing bubbles, that's where it works um, really, really nicely with that. Uh, this one sounds a little bit meaner than it actually is, but with holding items, so um, this is when we really want to, um, to increase motivation for kind of transitive conditional motivation operations. So um, when, when children need something to complete a task, you can just kind of withhold it and provide access based on them um, attempts to get them to communicate. Um, needing help. So this is a very, very common one. So um, putting things up high, putting things in Ziploc bags, the, the children need the help to, to be able to access them. Um, so a similar way to Emma's study, we also had fidelity checklist. Um, this was to, um, to ensure that the parents were actually doing what it is that we wanted them to do within the play sessions. Um, so this is the checklist for manding. Um, so do they actually use one of the creation activities that we suggested? Um, do they utilize child initiation? So this was a very important component. Um, there was kind of two ways which parents could score score down on this one. Um, were they, was that initiation there and they weren't utilizing it or were they trying to prompt language when that initiation wasn't there? Um, so that was a very important component. Um, was the child attending to the, to the parent or were they trying to prompt language when the child was kind of looking um, over the other side of the room? Um, do they use the correct prompt technique uh, so we taught them to use an echoic prompt, which we then attempt to fade using a uh, time delay. So first of all, three seconds and then five seconds to try and give the child that opportunity um, to increase their independence. Um, and do they reinforce the communication appropriately? So for this, obviously, we're talking about the man strategies. So that involves them providing access to the object, providing access to the activity. Um, so the way I collected data on this was I used interval recording. So every 20 seconds of each video, I assessed whether the parents were doing these strategies or not. I think perhaps for real life, um, real life situations, this might not probably be overkill. Um, but for research purposes, it worked well to have a kind of really robust um, fidelity checklist and collection system. Okay, so these were um, some of the strategies that we used um, to uh, promote tacting. So in a similar way to the manding, parents were then taught activities um, which were designed to increase the chances that of their, their child tacting and to increase opportunities when they could start to, to include tacting. Um, so this were really designed to kind of increase the salience of the object, um, to highlight the object to the, to the child. Um, and additionally, to, to kind of um, enhance the value of parental attention as a, as a reinforcer. Um, so some of the examples, um, so hidden items. Uh, so imagine you have a huge big tub of slime that you would hide different animals in, um, pulling out all the different animals, being like, wow, look what I found. I found an elephant, I found, um, I found a giraffe. Um, within that slime, it kind of highlights the, the item to the to the child. Um, another example, having items hidden under cups, um, un unveiling them under the cups, being like, wow, I found this. Um, next strategy um, is a reveal. So this worked really, really well um, for one of the, the children who took part in this project. He really, really liked matching cards. So it was, he loved kind of flipping them over and then seeing what was under them. 
Um, so this involves uh, hiding the identity of pictures of objects and then turning them over dramatically, um, making a game out of it to reveal what they are. Um, could also work, you could then introduce a matching game going forward. So this is a very um, common strategy, just, um, just tacting within um, a book or a film, just kind of pointing at the items, tacting a few, and then getting the children to, to, um, to label them on their own. The next one, things being out of place. So this is one that really did try to um, increase the attention to the item, try to increase the, the motivation to label the item. So imagine you open the fridge and there's a lot of vehicles in there. You go, why are these vehicles in the fridge? This is very exciting. Um, you could provide, imagine you give a box of crayons to the child and they, they tip it out and there's a spider in there, not, not a real spider, a toy spider in there. Um, and they, that would be something that's a kind of, interesting occurrence that we'd maybe want to, to label. Um, additionally, it was not only things that could be seen that we suggested, also sounds. Um, I don't think any of the parents actually used this one within their within their play, but um, for example, you could play different sounds on your phone and get them to, to tact what they are hearing. Um, one of the parents actually used um, a really nice thing where she um, the child was very into essential oils, so she got him to tact what he was smelling so that was really nice <clears throat> so in a similar way to the manding we had another fidelity checklist um, so it's important to note that the, the parents weren't they weren't asked to inc include all of these activities just whether they had a kind of activity ongoing um, so did they use an, uh, an activity to support tacting um, did they check that the child is attending to the object or were they attend were they trying to to, um, to prompt a child to, to label something when they weren't looking in that direction. Um, did they provide the correct SD? Uh, so this can include, um, so we wanted to kind of match the way that, that we learn tax and the way that we use tax um, naturally. So we wanted to include both spontaneous tax and also tax that, um, that had a supplementary question. So the correct SD in this case could be um, the parents asking, oh, what do you see or what's that? Um, or it could just be a spontaneous tax that the, that the child is admitting. In that case, it would be marked as not applicable. Um, do they use the correct prompt techniques? Um, so again, we used a quote prompts, um, which we attempted to fade. And do they reinforce the communication? So obviously this time, um, it was important that the child didn't actually want the item. If the child didn't, if the child wanted the item, we wouldn't be considering it attacked. Um, so they would reinforce the communication just with kind of social praise and an interaction. Okay. Um, so the intraverbal strategies, we didn't, we didn't teach any actual activities that the intraverbals would be would be based upon, but we did. Um, teach teach the parents to kind of increase the um, to just kind of introduce the interverbal um, interverbals into the play scenarios that were already going on. Um, so this can include things like um, song fill-ins, animal signs. Um, we extended a little bit to questions about feature function or class. Um, they were very much individualised to each child um, and depend depending on the complexity that they could kind of they could the level they were at that they could learn. Um, so some of the intraverbals that we were able to um, introduce were, so for example, um, just a fill-in for an animal sign. So sheep says, you say ba, um, different songs, so the ending of different songs. Um, and then with one of the participants, we could introduce some, some kind of more advanced questions like what do we do with pizza um, or something like that. Uh, so the, the fidelity checklist for this were, was um, <clears throat> during appropriate play activity, do they pause the play and check the child is attending? Um, do they present the intraverbal? Um, do they use the correct prompt technique? And do they reinforce the communication? Um, so a way that this might all work together, so the parents were taught each strategy kind of separately. They were taught to kind of build on within their play session. Um, so for example, one of the participants, a little boy, really liked figurines. He really liked... Um, he really liked jungle animal figurines so the parent was able to to have these available within his environment but then she was able to get him to man for each figurine 
um, she kept them in the box. So she failed to increase his um, increase his motivation by perhaps giving him just a couple. He was then able to man for more. He would then kind of set them up. She was able to go through them and tack them. And then she was able to do some of the intraverbal um, animal sounds. So that's the way it could kind of all work together. Okay, so the child dependent variables. So we had um, frequency of man's tacks and intraverbals um, per each 10 minute video collected. Um, so we really tried very hard to kind of operationalize the verbal operants in a way that would allow for them to be collected separately, but with still an understanding that, of course, in our in our verbal behavior, there is dual, co dual control that does occur. Um, so this involved kind of highlighting what is the, the primary operant that is being that is that is actually being um, emitted here so for example um, the definitions included things like if the child was reaching for an item if they were engaging with the item after they after they um, used the name then then it would be considered attacked um, so or for the intraverbal uh, fill-ins did the did the the child admit that behavior as a result of a verbal SD from the parent um, and if that was the case that it wasn't um, there wasn't a verbal SD, then we could consider it an intraverbal, obviously. Um, so we tried to really operationalize them in a way that allowed the, the data collection to, to still um, be presented across verbal operants. Um, additionally, we looked at overall verbal behavior. So this was just all of the all of the different um, all of the different verbal operants totaled up across the sessions. Um, and then we looked at positive affect. Um, so this is quite a unique measure, especially within the telehealth research. Um, so <clears throat> it has been um, indicated that positive affect might um, have some indication of um, internal states of happiness. We did use kind of neurotypical of this measure um, in the next few slides. Okay, I make this a bit bigger. Um, so these were the results for the parental fidelity. So the first on the left hand side, um, you can see Rosa's, and on the right hand side, you can see McKenna's. Um, so you can see that both parents did in show increases in, um, in fidelity across sessions and um, across when, when the training was introduced, they did show increases. Um, there was obviously some variability uh, in primarily in McKenna's. Um, this is perhaps more a uh, limitation of the data collection than anything, um, but I'll discuss that a little bit in subsequent slides. So these were some of the outcomes for the children who took part. So you can see again, there's some lovely increases, a lot of variability, but this is kind of to be expected, these were real life demonstrations of um, of a training which took place in a in an environment that wasn't so controllable, and it was um, there was lots of different variables that were that were at play. But I think you can see that there is some nice increases in in um, behavior across all verbal operants. Um, so these are the graphs that I spoke about. These are some graphs that show some lovely gains. Um, <clears throat> for both participants, obviously this isn't presented in a multiple baseline, so we can't really determine any kind of functional cause, but I think it acts as a, su a supplement um, to the other multiple baseline graphs. It just shows some really lovely increases in um, total verbal behaviour for both participants, um, even more than I actually, to be honest, even more than I expected <laughs> um, for both participants. They had some really nice outcomes. Okay, so like I said before, this is affect, um, and this is when you start to see the kind of um, difference in the in the, the outcomes between the participants. So on the right of your screen, this one here, you can see Dennis. Um, so the training um, resulted in increases in his affect. He really seemed to enjoy the, the strategies that his mother was doing. He really seemed to enjoy the activities. He was very, um, uh, can everybody hear? Um, I think it might just be one person. Um, he really seemed to enjoy the um, 
the strategies and we saw some some really lovely um, increases in his affect which kind of matched previous research projects that the first research project that I did conduct um, in terms of Hugo's data there was obviously a lot more um, variability uh, so he did have some increases um, and then some really steep decreases in his affect um, there are some missing data points for Hugo, which was a result of the filming not capturing enough of his face for us to be able to determine um, enough of the intervals um, were, were able, uh, I think less than 50% of the intervals we weren't able to, to see. Um, so there are some gaps. Um, there's obviously a lot going on. And again, um, and again, these, um, because they're not presented in in any sort of way to determine the functional relationship is a bit tricky, but around about session 12, two things happened with the COVID lockdown um, and also tacting was, was introduced. Um, so Hugo in particular had a bit of a history with tacting with his with his mother. She she focused a lot on kind of DTT skills and when when it first started there was a lot of kind of escape behaviour around tacting. So it could be uh, it could be that. It could simply be that we were measuring the wrong behaviour for Hugo. Um, so Hugo, um, so Hugo was basically um, a child that that showed a lot of kind of self-stimulatory behaviour. Um, he uh, he maybe perhaps indicated his happiness in a slightly different way um, than neurotypical indices of happiness. So this is something that we weren't able to to measure within this specific project. Um, so that's something to think about for future projects and I know there's a lot of research out there that has um, that has promoted this individualized measures of affect but unfortunately that was time and con different constraints for this for this um, research we weren't able to do that um, so this is the social validity so I took two different measures of social validity the first was just a Likert scale so you can see that the parents um, rated the, the training very favourably across kind of both the, the procedures and the outcomes. Um, the second was um, the second was a semi-structured interview where I was able to kind of elaborate on some more of these of the thoughts of the parents. Um, so this is a really nice quote that came from that. So after finishing the programme, I, I feel more secure to play with my son. I've learned that ABA can be fun too, and my son is happier that we use naturalistic teaching. And that's actually very interesting because that is the mother of Hugo, who is the son who didn't really show much change in his affect during the session. So it's perhaps good that she maybe recognised that he was enjoying it in some way. So that's very nice. Oops. Um, so in conclusion, uh, so the, the project demonstrated an effective use of telehealth um, a telehealth training platform to provide parent training and naturalistic behavioural strategies. Uh, it's one of the first applications of this naturalistic parent training project using solely telehealth within a European setting, improved parental fidelity um, and improved child verbal behaviour operants. Uh, withstood the test of lockdown. So I think this is very important because obviously the children are at the, in their house all the time, they're seeing the same toys, they're seeing the, they're only their parents. Um, there's a very big risk that anything that we do would, would lead to um, kind of reduced measures and um, because everything that we try to use as reinforcement, this may be being satiated. Um, but with this, we find that this wasn't the case and it's a hope that the strategies that we used that really focused on motivation, um, it's a hope that they kind of, they kind of counterbalance this, this situation. Um, again, it's rated highly by parents. <clears throat> okay, so limitations. So obviously no research is perfect and this research is far from perfect. So just some of the limitations that I can discuss now. Uh, so I think the main limitation for this was the data collection system that I used. Um, so this involved parents sending one video in which they demonstrated all of the strategies. Um, so this was a little bit tricky to for them to incorporate some of um, incorporate all into the one session in a way that they could reach the level of fidelity, reach the level of occurrences and fidelity that needed. Um, there was definitely ceiling effects, which led to variability in the data. Uh, so I, I kind of had to think about 
ways to rectify this. Um, one of the things that I thought about was having the parents send separate videos, but I don't think um, that would actually work. I think the way that the the way that the sessions run, the way that the the different teaching strategies were kind of intermixed, um, I feel like that wouldn't necessarily work. Um, another thing um, would potentially be to have the parents to um, self-monitor. So they would have targets that they would have to um, introduce. For example, you have to use 10 manding, um, manding opportunities within the session and they could score themselves against those targets. I think that would be very good in terms of the data collection, but it might be a little bit stressful for the parents to, to, um, to have to constantly be reviewing their videos but something to think about. Um, additionally, multiple control of verbal operants and other limitations. So like I said, we tried to really operationalize the, the, the operants so they could be displayed in a way that was separate, but it's everyday life, it's everyday verbal behavior. There is obviously some multiple control there. Um, another limitation, so um, like I said, the parents were really motivated to learn about ABA. They were motivated enough to go out and do specific training. Um, so that is a, a limitation that it might not generalize to other parents, especially within kind of real life settings. Um, additionally, both were stay at home mothers. So they did have a kind of increased amount of time to, to make the videos, to collect the videos, to take part in the training. Um, another limitation, I think the ability to generalize to other children. So both of the children um, within, within this training had interests that were that worked particularly well with tacting so I mentioned one about the figurines and about the matching um, so these these were particularly good for the tacting had these interests not have been present I don't think the results could have been achieved um, when I think to other participants in other research uh, there was slightly um, I don't think we would have had the same outcomes so that's something to think about as well but the ability to generalize to other children who maybe don't have these interests and maybe something that you might have to do beforehand um, to ensure that it's that it's successful um so i'm going to bring emma back in now um, in <laughs> um and we'll just kind of go through um some of the problems and some of the solutions that we um encounter during our projects Obviously, um, obviously, since we undertook these projects, they were kind of um, quite early on in terms of the telehealth lifespan. So there's obviously been a lot of um, solutions, a lot of different platforms, applications that have been developed since we did this. Um, so that's something to think about, obviously, as well. Um, but firstly, one thing that I think we both had a lot of problem with was um, poor internet connection, so resulting in calls being dropped. Um, so like here, is the, I think I'm seeing people are dropping in and out of, of, um, of this presentation. So that was something that we both we both had to deal with. Um, some of the solutions that we had, we used mobile network a lot. We would switch to kind of hotspots, turning the video off on our end, watching a little bit of, of the, the coaching and then providing feedback. Um, I think just to add there, Jenny, as well, you know, turning the video off on our end I found was really useful um, not only just to help with internet connection but also to prevent the child from becoming distracted from seeing us on the screen you know um, the interventionists my interventionist your parents that they weren't required to to see us in the video just hear us and that's where the earbuds came in really well too that they could just hear us um, additionally one of my participants actually um the internet the wi-fi in the school had dropped one day she connected to her mobile hotspot and ended up having to pay for more data on her phone mm. um so although although in our pre both our previous research we have analyzed the cost effectiveness of telehealth and and how telehealth is more cost effective than traditional face-to-face services there are extra additional costs that come with technology so again maybe you do need to buy um more mobile data you you need to have good strong internet you know we need all of this equipment too i find especially within um actually both projects we provided um if needed we provided a webcam for them to use but i find that mobile phones were actually the most useful um the use, useful component 
Um, so the cameras on mobile phones are probably better than any sort of webcam. Um, a lot of mobile phones these days have, have really excellent cameras, so they're they're also kind of portable, they're hideable. Um, so I find mobile phones, not just for the internet, but also for recording purposes, um, really, really useful. And I think it would be really good addition to, to the research to see if, um, to see if, if, if there's a possibility of conducting training just using mobile phones, that would be a really, mm -hmm. a really good I know, I think that would be really interesting because, you know, I, I know particularly in, in my studies, Jenny, I can't remember if you had the same problem as well, as sometimes the children would become so distracted by the laptop being present or this big camera being present. You know, it's not it's not something that is typically used to being in, in the environment, in a school, envi school environment anyway, whereas it, it, the laptop kind of acted as a reactivity effect. You know, if we were to come in face to face and observe, um, observe a child, nine times out of ten either the behavior we're looking for doesn't happen or or it happens like at a, a really increased rate because of the reactivity effect so i think it's important to note that like the technology and the laptop being present can also have those reactivity mm -hmm. effects but using a mobile phone you know nine times out of ten everybody has mobile phone kids are so used to seeing their parents on mobile phones um i don't know how that would work in the school environment i know they're pretty strict about mobile phones and I know when, when the children go out shot, you know, it's easier to follow around with a phone than hike a big laptop around with you, you know? Yes, definitely. And I think mobile phones, in terms of disseminating to broader fields, I think a lot of the kind of advances in technology, the advances in um, ha increasing internet access to, to different countries um, is kind of fueled by mobile phone technology. So again, that would be something. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I think we both had this problem, difficulties uploading videos. Um, so we both used Dropbox. It was a bit, a bit of a torture, to be honest. It no. um, <laughs> would take forever. And if the internet cut off slightly, you would, the parent or the, the participant would unfortunately have to start all over again. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things I suggested they do, they split up the videos. Um, they maybe half them, sometimes quartered them. So I would see four videos as opposed to just one, but it did make it a lot easier to send. And um, we used an additional secure server as well. Mm -hmm. um, so this wasn't so much within this project, this was more to do with the previous project, so parental cancelling and rescheduling. Um, I don't know if it's something specific to telehealth, um, because it is more flexible, there's maybe not so much stigma around cancelling because you know that perhaps um, the, the professional hasn't travelled um, very far there, they're just kind of in their, in their office or in their home, mm -hmm. um, so there maybe was a higher level of um, rescheduling than there would have been and I had that I have experienced um, using face to face. Um, I think as well, you know, um, the benefit of telehealth is that nine times out of ten it makes your schedule a little bit more flexible. So if there is a cancellation or a rescheduling, you're able to reschedule it nine times out of ten you're able to do it because you, you haven't blocked out like this three hour travel time there and back yeah. in your schedule. So, so you have these blocks free but that is something that we did see an increase of. So I think if anyone is looking to adopt a telehealth model, um, you know, make sure that you have something stipulated in your contract about cancellations. Um, because nobody um, wants to be going from their sofa to their telehealth laptop at um, seven o'clock at night. So yeah, make yeah. sure you, you have those stipulated. I think it's contract. important to also have boundaries, have boundaries as a behavior analyst, have boundaries as yeah. when you're providing these services, because technically you could provide services at eight o'clock at night if that's your yeah. family, but to have boundaries within yourself and not to let it kind of take over, not to let it become part of your environment as well, that you're, you're always working via telehealth. Absolutely, yep. Um, the next one, quality of shots, um, videos recorded. Um, so this was evidence within my, sort of my, my um, research. Uh, so having clear instruction provided, operation defined, objective data collection systems. Um, Just looking for, at the time, Jenny, we'll fly yeah. through the next slide so we can get the questions in. More slides. Yeah. Um, so just some general guidance just to test the equipment and the environment prior to the sessions, um, to test it works, but to also kind of get the, the children um, used to being used to having the equipment within the environment. Um, opt for an external webcam. Don't use internal webcams on your camera. Bug ear headphones work very well. Can I just actually 
add there, Jenny, sorry to interrupt you, but can I just actually add about the bug in ear headphones? I found them to be so, so effective, especially for the FA. Um, two of the kids we didn't conduct an alone condition because their fast indicated um, social functions, but one of the children we did conduct an alone condition and the bug in ear headphones really, really helped in terms of safety. So um, the interventionist was instructed to leave the child in the room safely we made sure that, that the environment was safe she left the room we were able to observe on camera what she was doing but the interventionist still wore the headphones so in the event that anything dangerous was about to happen or if we felt that the child was unsafe in any way we could just quickly say hey you need to come back in and we need to end the condition so um it was that was really useful i find that the use of headphones they were very useful when they worked, but they could perhaps be a little bit of a distraction for some of the parents who were like, why is my, why does my mum have this strange thing in their ear? Um, mm -hmm. so the other suggestions, um, potentially switching off the video, that helps with the call, um, having a practice session. Um, this is something I used with my first study, but not so much this one, um, was considering using a, a task analysis to explain the telehealth. Um, so I just created a really simple um, visual task analysis to show each of the components that the parents had to do to access the training um, and each of the components they had to do to upload the video, um, etc. Oh, lost my mouse. Okay, so just really quickly, um, just to kind of sum up what's next. Um, so we covered this a little bit at the start. Um, basically, just the telehealth provisions had such an unprecedented test um, during COVID-19. Uh, lots of practitioners were kind of forced to put the cart before the horse. They were support. They were kind of forced to use the strategies without the supportive evidence being there, which of course we're always taught not to do um, if we're following the ethical guidelines. But this was such an unprecedented situation that nobody really know, knew what to do. Um, it was very good that telehealth was there to kind of provide this backup. Um, thank, thankfully, um, research is now beginning to catch up. So a lot of the strategies that were kind of questionable before, there's now kind of a good research base um, for them. Uh, it's my hope for telehealth going forward in the future that it's it's used um, for more than just cost saving. Um, it's used for more than just insurance companies recognising it's a kind of cheaper way to, to for people to access services. Um, that would be a little bit of a worry of mine that is that, that is a way that it could be used. Um, has been identified by the World Health Organization um, as having great potential um, to help the imbalance um, in global health provisions. Um, so hopefully that is something that more research can be built upon. Um, we need more research in economically developing countries um, going forward. There's a lot of research coming out of um, Houston, which is obviously very, very excellent um, recommendations, but I think there needs to be more, um, more studies happening in these countries. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I don't know if Catherine wants to come back. There were a lot of questions, but they seem to have disappeared. It might have been because of the crash. Um, not sure. Oh, and they are here. Oh yeah. Okay. So we have one, um, Jenny, just about um, your participants for the um, from Germany and. So yes, then, um, I forgot to mention that in my presentation, actually. Um, so the, the participants primarily converse with me, um, actually wholly converse with me in English because I don't speak German. They were both native German speakers. Um, but when they interacted with their child, they actually interacted mostly in German, um, a little bit of English um, here and there, but mostly in German. So I did actually have to use a translator um, who translated the videos before they could be scored. Um, so that's something to think about. I didn't use a translator for our sessions because they had really good English, but for um, the videos, I, I did. Great. Um, there's a question here about if I could provide some more information about the MyWay card. Yes, yeah, sorry, I um, don't think I explained that very well in the presentation. The um, We use the MyWay card for Daniel because the results of his FA indicated his behaviours were being maintained by access to attention and escape from demand. So we used the MyWay card as an omnibus man so that 
um, when he presented the My Way card, he would get to escape from demand and gain access to his teacher's attention at the same time. So, um, Susmita and um, Katharina, their behaviours were both maintained by escape from demand to their SCT um, communication response that was targeted was to ask for a break. Um, and they were both vocal requests. Um, I have a question here. So, um, asking if there's a way to access the multiple choice knowledge test for the parents' ABA knowledge. Um, these are actually in, so the publication that I linked, and I think Katrina linked, um, it's actually <coughs> supplementary material of that publication. <laughs> it's a bit of a long way to get it, but it's there. Great. Um, there's another one there, Jenny, I think this is more relating to your study. How would these procedures for parents generalise to teenage clients? <laughs> Um, that's a very good question. I, I think it would just kind of involve having um, more individualised um, individualised motivation, so different strategies, um, different activities that would be more motivational perhaps for teenagers. Um, there's definitely, I, definitely ways to do it, but in terms of these strategies, they were kind of designed for, for younger learners. Um, but there would be definitely ways to do it kind of... Um, so, for example, having a computer game and not having um, the mouse needed to play it, stuff like that, they would definitely be be able to be incorporated into learners who were older and maybe had different, some different um, interests. I think as well when you're when you're working with older learners, of course, like communication is still going to be a very socially significant goal. But as children get older, they goals are shifting too you know we're looking at maybe targeting more functional living skills and that's actually what my um, previous study focused on um targeting functional living skills via telehealth um so maybe like you know teaching employ employability skills things like that depending on the age of of the child of course you're, you're still going to work on on your verbal offerings but they're also important goals to consider as well can I say that in relation to the slides, or for anyone who needs more information, you can use any of the emails that you can see on the screen. We can um, send out the slides as well. That's another question. And then, just as a reminder, uh, Jenny and Emma's video will be online. Um, it will be published, and you will be able to access it through the Center for Behavior Analysis webpage under resources. Uh, we will have it up in a few days and it will be open for you to record, uh, sorry, to, uh, to view at a later stage if you wish. So, enter for behavior analysis webpage under resources or events, if you remember that. There was another question around language. So, do you want to say anything, uh, Jenny or Emma? about any cultural limitations or the level of English that you would feel parents or professionals would need in order to avail of such uh, service? I, I, I just start, Danny, if you don't mind. I think, um, of course, it would be great to have practitioners that spoke in the primary language of the um, participants that are, that are involved, and that would be really encouraged. But, you know, as Jenny said, there, there, there is ways around it. You know, she employed a translator, but then you, you maybe also have some confounds there as well. You know, is, is your translator trained in um, the science that we're trained in? And are, are, do we know if they're translating the right information that, that we are providing? Um, so as always, we, we, we always want to aim to um, have practitioners be from the same culture because as I mentioned before it just highlights and creates like culturally sensitive interpretations especially for the participants involved um, but sometimes it's not always the case um, I'm not sure if there's any research out there it's something maybe we should look into Jenny about like previous lang language like language abilities so uh, when I the way I used my translator was I only got her to translate the videos um, where a lot of the other research a lot of um, uh, the kind of global applications have used translators to actually kind of facilitate the coaching sessions, which is not something that I needed to do. That is kind of a really good, it has a dual purpose. So obviously it translates, um, 
but it also provides that kind of cultural sensitivity. So mm -hmm. they obviously have knowledge of the culture along with the language. So that's a really important, important facet. Um, so I think that that option being there is very important for a number of different reasons. Um, additionally, I think there's other ways to, um, well, I didn't include any kind of different adaptations for any sort of different cultures um, because they were from a similar kind of European culture and because um, uh, both me and Katrina had research work, had um, experience working um, kind of across a broad range within Europe, but um, but there are different strategies that you can use. So, for example, like a pyramid approach where you have a kind of facilitator um, in the country um, that you would then train, who would then go on to subsequently train. That's another good way of doing it. Mm -hmm. The, the door to more telehealth research and clinical practice has just opened more widely in the last couple of years. So all of those great ideas are to be assessed in, in future research. Yeah. So can I say thank you very much, both Emma and Jenny. Thanks, Chris and uh, Mary, for the support. I think that's all for today. Thanks very much for everyone for, for attending. Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye.